Welcome! This is the recording of the seminar Internet Partner Violence Has No Gender at Mid-Sweden University in March 2020. Participating in the seminar is the researcher Teresa Silva and John James, the author of the book From the Darkness. My name is Teresa Silva. I'm a forensic psychologist and a researcher in the criminology field. And before we start, just let you know. That you can put your questions in Swedish or in English if you want, in any time during the seminar. Um, uh, yes, you just have to grab your phone while you're speaking. You just have to grab your phone. Go to 3w.menti.com, introduce the code 188346, and post your question. At the end of the seminar, John and I will start to answer all the questions. And uh, if we run out of time, if you put any questions, if we run out of time, we will answer the remaining questions in afterwards in a podcast that we will upload in our Criminology Mini YouTube channel. And uh, starting now with the content of the seminar, I want to briefly explain you how I became interested in uh, studying, evaluating and interviewing men who have been victims of intimate partner violence. Um, during my years as a, a forensic a psychologist, practitioner and as a researcher, I worked directly with many men, some women too, perpetrators of many different types of crime, violent crimes in many occasions. Um, my experience with victims focus on children, victims of maltreatment and sexual abuse um, uh, that were that during adolescence, later during adolescence, developed themselves criminal and violent behavior. So the, 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 my experience in the domestic context was related to uh, to, to uh, adult uh, maltreatment or their children or child to parent violence. The few cases of intimate partner violence that I met were of men, in general with severe problems of uh, alcohol and drug abuse, who used to behave violently not only toward their spouses but toward almost anyone who dared to get in close to them in especially while they were intoxicated. More, my years, my years of education, uh, research practice, and uh, living in Spain where Catholicism is still so dominant, taught me that males are the perpetrators, females are the victims when we talk about domestic violence. And furthermore, the, all the, the, the reports the, the statistics reported every year about uh, homic female homicide perpetrated by their partners seem to confirm what we already knew, or what I already knew, or what I thought that I already knew. But almost anecdotally, due to my immense admiration for whom I think is one of the best actors of all time, I came across a high-profile case that perhaps you have heard of it. In this case, the female spouse reported to the police in May 2016 that she had been victim of physical assault by her partner. In consequence, she was granted a restraining order. The day that she reported the abuse to the police, she was seen and photographed with a bruise around her eye and on her right cheek. Now, the interesting thing is that the day after, she was also photographed and the bruise had miraculously disappeared. Furthermore, uh, multiple camera footage of the CCTV system of, the, of their apartment clearly show it that there was no injury in any physical part of her body. Now, those of you, we don't have police here, but perhaps social services, uh, even uh, victim support know that false allegations in divorce processes are more, well, are not infrequent. Happens in general to enhance the uh, chances of care the custody of the children or for financial profit. That for me it seems to be the case. Initially it seems to be the case here. 
She also, I also see, uh, saw some uh, video uh, of her depositions, and after reading and went through the case court files, I got the suspicion that she might have uh, high levels of psychopathic traits that for not had been uh, a topic of my research. But my attention turned from her when I started to go deeper in the court files and I realized that the case was not only about false allegations, but that in multiple occasions she had had violent outbursts in which she had kicked, slapped, beaten, uh, and thrown objects at, the, at her partner. In one occasion, due to the violence deployed in one of his uh, outbursts, he had to receive medical attention specifically surgery for a complete severed finger. While in the hospital, he got an infection by an um, uh, antibiotic multi-resistant bacteria and almost lost his arm. But as it happens, in so many occasions, he didn't report. If any of you has ever worked with victims of internet partner violence, this might sound quite familiar. There are also some um, Albior recorded phone calls in which she admitted that she had beaten him. And even in one occasion, she mocked him and writes something like this that I'm going to read for you. Quote, go, go and say, I, Johnny Depp, a man I am a victim to of domestic violence. See how many people believe or side with you, end quote. So, white middle-aged, rich, famous men can be victims to you? Victims of female perpetrators, perpetration of internet partner violence? Immediately, 100 questions came to my mind. How many men are there victims of internet partner violence? Who are these men? What are the statistics? Do they report as same as women? What happens when they report? Are they believed? What are the consequences of the abuse to their health? Um, and one million questions that came to my mind. And so I did what in general we researchers do. I start to search for information. But from the beginning, <laughs> this is an anecdote. I was advised and uh, well, for <coughs> a friend, a colleague and a good friend of mine that Perhaps it was not wise for my career to go on that direction because if I tried to write articles about men victims of internet partner violence, I should expect many difficulties to publish them. Anyway, those of you who know me know that my concern is not, or my first concern is not about exactly how successful my academic career is. My first concern is and has always been for the victims. Any victim. It doesn't matter how poor or how rich you are. It doesn't matter if you are a native or an immigrant. It doesn't matter if you are black or white, old or young, fat or thin. It doesn't matter if you are a woman or a man. If you are a victim, that's it. You deserve all my respect. I do care for you and I'll do whatever I can to help and to support you. Anyway, what I bring to you today here is a uh, small part of the information that I came across during my uh, review of the scientific literature and the window for what my research is about. I aim to deeply analyze the experiences of men victims of intimate partner violence in order to understand the whole victimization process, not only at the hands of an abusive partner, but also at the hands of those institutions that supposedly exist to protect them, what in criminology we call secondary victimization. I'm working in place of this model here that is perhaps a, a bit complex, but if someone feels interested at the end, I can explain to you. But just going and taking a look on the, on the <coughs> scientific literature, interesting results on the scientific literature, the first that caught my attention is that since the 70s of the past century, many studies have demonstrated that the rates of male and female perpetration of intimate partner violence are quite similar. 
maintain this big national surveys in which a large number of individuals is inquired. In, to in 2012, for example, the uh, National Intimate Partner and uh, Sexual Violence Survey in the United States found that more men than women had been, in the previous 12 months, victims of physical, physical violence in an intimate context. And that over 40% of the severe physical violence was directed at men. But this is not what we would expect, right? At least it was not what I was expecting. We are much more used to, uh, to information like this, to graphs like this, that represents the number of cases of intimate partner violence reported to the Swedish police, and in which we can see clear that men are only the 20% of the total amount of victims. So what does this mean? That in the United States we have more men being victimized than we have in Sweden, or is any of these statistics wrong, or the study is wrong? What happened is this, is that the studies that I showed you in the United States are based in surveys in which the person self-report very anonymously. While the case in Sweden represents the reports that the police consider as a case. And for that, first, the man or the person needs to give the step to go to the police and report. And second, under the same circumstances, the police might be willing to consider the incident as a case if it's reported by a woman than if it's reported by a man in this context. What perhaps is happening is, ha is that we are in the same historical moment with men that we were with women 20 years ago. 20 years ago, the whole justice system, many social partners, politicians, policy makers deployed an enormous effort to encourage more women victims to report the violence that they were submitted to behind closed doors. And on that moment, many social movements rise, and in a gradual manner, but steadily, we all were able to make that each time more women reported. And we can see it in this graph that represents the number of cases of gender violence reported to the police in Spain. The problem is that in countries like Spain, there is a law for gender violence for women victims, but there is not a law for gender violence for, the, for men victims. So this is discrimination. What perhaps has happened is that, or my lecture, my, my, my reading, what has happened is that in our effort to help women, we forgot a part of the whole group of victims. If this part is 20% or 50%, perhaps that depends on how we measure it. But for sure, there are men victims of intimate partner violence. Now this, of course, what leads is that men do not report. Men do not seek for help. And when they do, they are just not believed. And all the misandristic messages that are coming out every day, everywhere, are making the problem even worse. Perhaps what we must do is start to deploy for the whole society without discriminating victims by gender the same effort that they deploy for women so that we are able to decrease the total amount of victims of violence in intimate context. Not only those perpetrated by men against women but also those perpetrated by women against men and by men against men and by women against women. I mean, let's not discriminate victims. Let's not stigmatize them. Let's not make them suffer beyond what they already suffer behind the, the walls of their homes. Let's not use them for our political purposes. And opening now a bit a window for you of what my research is about, uh, today we have, we have with us John James who himself was a victim of an 18 months nightmare that he so well described in his book From the Darkness, released in 2018, and that I, of course, um, uh, recommend to you all. John?
think of your book, you painted Monica as a delightful, lovely, uh, shy woman that brought you joy and happiness. So for a while, you saw that she was the woman of your dreams. Yeah. Can you tell us how it all started? Um, I was, I was married at the time, and um, the marriage wasn't wasn't going well, and um, I never even thought of like meeting anybody else. And I walked into work one day, and uh, Monica was there, and it was like, like you, like you see in, in films, fireworks, and you know, and such. And uh, and she, I just thought she was amazing from the moment I saw her, mm -hmm. and um, and we just got to talking, and uh, and she said everything right, mm -hmm. everything that that. I felt she felt everything that I liked, she liked, you know, and I, it was like the perfect match. And um, and a month, month into us working together and talking and getting together, then I I ended my marriage that I wasn't happy with then, and began to see my girl. When did the the uh, the abuse start in your relationship? See, I didn't. I didn't see from the beginning. Or just um, later in the about, uh, about a month in, about a month in, um, I didn't see it as abuse at first because mm -hmm. it was what she called playing. Mm -hmm. So she pinched my 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 flesh and twisted it really hard, mm -hmm. or she punched me in the, punched me in the chest. Mm -hmm. And if I if I said anything, if I if I complained that it hurt, then it was. Uh, you're supposed, to, you're supposed to be a man, I'm only playing for God's sake, mm -hmm. you know? So, um, eventually I stopped complaining mm -hmm. about it, because in my mind it was like, am I, is she, is she really playing, am I just being too soft, am I being too sensitive? So, eventually I stopped complaining about that. So you take the question, am I being a man or not for yourself? Yeah, yeah, and I, I, I thought, am I, am I really being too sensitive? You know, I am supposed to be a, a guy here, so. Yeah, okay. You tell the reader that soon after you started your relationship, Monica wanted to have control of your moves. Yeah. Right? So, know where you were all the time, blackmail you even, so you would get back home yeah. when she wanted. What did you usually do then when she? Did that that moves and how did it make you feel? The first time she did it, I went to a I went to a, a, a comedy concert that I'd had tickets for for twelve months, and I said I was going. And she said, no, no, you can't go. I need you here. And I said, well, what what do you need me for? And she couldn't answer. She just needed. She just wanted me to be there. Mm -hmm. So I did go to the concert, but before I before I left, I was. Ignored. When I did leave, I got nasty texts all the way to the concert. While I was uh, in the in the town where the concert was, and I didn't really enjoy it at all um, because this was just playing on my mind all the time. So, I, I had tickets for all the concerts that I didn't go to. One concert I did go to, and I had to lie about it. I had to say that I was going to a funeral. Um, and as for like uh, when I went to the pub to watch the football, which mm -hmm. I did quite often, I used to do quite often. She would text me all the time. She would call me all the time. And eventually, I stopped going because I knew that if I did go out, that's what I'd get. I wouldn't be able to enjoy anything. So I stopped going to that at all, and I, I didn't go out anywhere without her. Then. So for the, the rest of the time, you. you yeah. Go out with I'd go out, go out with her. She'd go out on her own. Mm -hmm. She'd go out to see her friends and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. But if I did, this is what I'd get. So I felt like I couldn't go out. I felt like I wouldn't enjoy it if I did because I'd just get the text and the calls. Mm -hmm. So I didn't go out except without her. So can I tell that that, it, that is your own decision in not going out because you you felt that you're yeah it was my it was my my own decision. But, but, but yeah, yeah. But I knew that I wouldn't enjoy it if I did go out. In your book, also, you describe nasty things that Monica used to say to you. 
to humiliate you, to destroy your self-esteem. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, many times she played with your dreams, for example, she knew very well that you wanted to have a child and she played with that. Yeah. Um, how often did that happen during your relationship and what effect did it have on you? She would do it a lot. Like I said about questioning my masculinity, she would do that a hell of a lot. Um, and it got to when we, when we, when she started an argument, it would be the nastiest thing she could come up with. Mm -hmm. And as soon as she see my face change, as soon as she hit the spot, so to speak, mm -hmm. then a little smile would come on her face mm -hmm. because she knew that that had hurt her. Mm -hmm. um, I ended up with no self-esteem, no confidence at all because that, because I was constantly called fat, old, ugly, anything to put me down. The worst um, comment was, uh, she always said, I want, a, I want a child with you. you, you're the only person that I want a child with, mm -hmm. you know, it would be great if we were a family, but when she got angry she'd say, if I ever got pregnant with your child I'd have an abortion. Mm -hmm. So, it was not all the time, sometimes she was happy and tell oh, things yeah. that you want to hear, yeah. and when she was on the bad mood, she would... Yeah, yeah, the nastiest thing she could come up with, yeah. Could you predict when... <coughs> the good moods and the bad moods? No. No. That was the scariest part. That um you could I could walk in walk in the house and I'd be like, okay, is this gonna be a good day or a bad day? Mm. And if it was a good day, great. It's like it's like drug addiction. If it was a good day, I was on a high. It was fantastic. If it was a bad day, mm. it just destroyed me. In any moment in these good days and these high parts were you thinking, oh my god, what's going to happen when these moments are finished? Or were you thinking that it's going to be a bad mood in, uh, after this? It would, it, would, it would start off that was there was clear good days and bad days. Mm -hmm. So if it was a good day, it would be a good day. If it was a bad day, it would be a bad day. But then it got to the point where total confusion sets in because a good day can turn into a bad day very quick. Just one thing wrong, said said wrong by me, or in her eyes, said wrong by me, or done wrong by me, could just turn it just like that. So it was very unpredictable. You described many episodes of physical assault perpetrated by Monica. Uh, occasionally hard enough to cause you to have to seek medical attention. Yeah. But if I quite understood, Monica was a short, skinny woman. Yeah. Did she really have the strength to, to harm you? I can answer that in, in several ways. Yes, because the, when, you're, when you're a man faced with, with that, you freeze because you don't know what to do. You, you can't hit back. You'll learn, you learn from an early age that men don't hit women. Um, I know that men do, but you know, if you're with a decent guy, then you don't hit a woman. So you don't know what to do. So when you freeze, which makes you a target, and then there's many a time where I've just stood there and I've just been punched and kicked and just can't do anything, don't do anything. And you can take any, any lady here, the, the shyest, most fragile lady here, and I mean, I'm a big bloke, she was only, only tiny, and she isn't going to do much damage, but add to that rage, mm -hmm. and then you've got a problem. Mm -hmm. when, when, there's, when there's rage behind it, yeah, she can do some damage. And she, uh, the first big attack that I had, she repeatedly kicked me in my back. The next day I collapsed at work, I was taken into hospital, gas and hair. Um, defended her because they said what had happened and I said oh look I was cleaning under the table and the chair that was on top of the table fell at me he didn't believe that and if that if I'd been a woman then he probably he might have reported that mm -hmm. but as a bloke he, he didn't um, and I was off work for five weeks three of those weeks on crutches mm -hmm. and even even though I was on crutches 
for those three weeks, she called me a failure. But you, you are telling these moments in, in which Monica are enraged, right? Yeah. And that, yeah. But you are also telling the uh, when she used it to play, the, what she called playing, yeah. right? And yeah. That also hurt you, yeah. I understand. So yeah. it was enraged, but also in moments that were not out of the range. Yes, yeah, yeah. The, the, the playing was, the playing wasn't rage at all. If you have somebody, it doesn't matter how strong you are, if you have somebody grab your skin and twist it, then that's, that's going to hurt. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. It comes to a moment in your book that it's clear that you were completely social isolated. Yeah. Right? So you didn't want to contact your parents, or you didn't want to contact your friends, and you didn't even know how to, um, to behave with your colleagues at work. No. How it is to live with the feeling that you have all the doors closed, in part because you have closed them. Lonely. Lonely. Scared. Confused. Um, she convinced me that everybody hated me at work. So, it was very awkward at work. I couldn't speak to anybody. I didn't trust anybody at work because of what she said. Um, and, uh, and I couldn't tell my friends or family what I was going, going through. My dad was, is, had been seriously ill for a while, so I didn't want to put that onto my family. In my, I, I didn't know whether my friends would be there or not, so I didn't talk to anybody really. And I felt ashamed of it as well. I felt ashamed of being you know, treated like that by, by a woman, by the person who was supposed to love me. Mm -hmm. And also because you split, you split mm -hmm. some time and after coming back with her, you didn't yeah. want to tell others. Yeah, you were ashamed. The, first, the first time that we split, I, I, I did tell a friend of mine and she said, uh, what would you do if it was me? And, she, and somebody treated me like that. I said, I wouldn't be happy about it. And she said, well, I'm not happy about it, so you cannot go back, John. Mm -hmm. So when I did, I can't tell my friends about that. I can't tell my friends that we've got back together again. Mm -hmm. That's the other question that I have for you. So there are moments in your book that it's clear that you cannot stand more that relationship. So mm -hmm. a couple of times you, you just break and split. Yeah. But uh, your fear of losing her makes you back again with her. How do you explain this? Simply, I can't. You I can't, can't I can't I can't ex why. I can't explain um why I had a fear of losing it. I don't know. Yeah. Um I do know that the reason that I I was was with it, the reason that I put up with that was hope. Hope, hope I, I I hoped she would change. I hoped I could be the man that she wanted me to be. Uh, I hoped it would it would get better. How can somebody who loves me as much as she said she did, in t in the good times, be so nasty to me, be so violent to me? There had to be, in my mind, there had to be something behind that. And it, if you read the book, you know you you can see her past that she did have a very abusive past. I wanted to understand that. I wanted to fix her, if you like, but I was never going to fix her. And I didn't understand that until it was over. Yeah. So during the whole relationship, there are moments that she says that she loves you. Yeah. That she keeps saying that she loves yeah. you. Yeah. And like I say, it was like it was like an addiction. Mm. It was like you you had you had the highs and you had the had the lows. Unfortunately, as the relationship progressed, the lows become more frequent. Mm -hmm. okay. Because there are moments also in your book that you describe that. She telling you that she hates you, absolutely yeah. hates you. And uh, there was one last question, is that uh, the last time you split, you went to the police to report to the abuse, but it seems that the police didn't believe you, no. right? No. So what made you on that moment go to the police? What made you finally say, I, I report this? And how the officer's response made you feel? The reason I went to the police is because when it was when it was over, there's that that space where you can get your head together. 
because when, when it's happening, you, your head's so messed up, you're so confused, um, that you, you don't do anything, because you, you can't function properly. So in that space where, where I could function properly, and I did eventually tell a friend of mine when it was over for good, and, and he said, you, you've got to report this. So I went to the police, and um, they took uh, all, the, all the information that I gave them. I gave them photographs of my flat that was smashed, smashed to pieces by her. But they said, oh no, we're not going to deal with that. We'll, we'll deal with the latest incident. All the other photographs they threw out, they ignored a 10 minute recording that I had of like just 10 minutes of who ranted at me and insulted me and belittled me. They, they completely ignored that. I had a photo of a, a bite mark on my hand that they did interview her about, and she said, I bit myself. And the police went, oh, it's your word against this. But as soon as I looked in that room, I knew that they didn't believe me. And they interviewed her just because it was routine. And they did nothing, which I felt totally lost out. If they, if they, they don't believe me, what, what can I do? And that's when um, I, I turned to punching myself in the face. And, and I, I got to a uh, cord around my neck and I passed out through strangling myself. Mm -hmm. So you described several um, the, the behaviors of yours of self destruct self destructive. Yeah, definitely. This. Yeah. Uh, how long did it take until you started feeling that you were getting over all the situation? That you I I I went to India uh, in Nepal just to find some breathing space, and the people that I met there were fantastic. Mm -hmm. They they taught me. A new way of living. That the past doesn't exist apart from in your own head. That you have to live in the now. You know? And when I came back and I, I when I when I was there, I thought about myself and my own uh, personality and I knew that I was perfect and I had to change and I had to give more. Uh, you know, when I got back. So I became a better person because of it. And I, I started to recover from that by living in the now. And that's when I wrote the book, and that was very cathartic then. Have you ever um, met Monica then? I've seen, her, I've seen her a few times. How do you feel? First time I saw her, it floored me. <laughs> um, yeah, it, it was all there. But then I saw I saw her with a new boyfriend, mm -hmm. and I thought, oh my god, and she was talking down to him, he was standing behind her, his head was down, he was, you know, okay, okay, agreeing with her, walking behind her, and I just thought, that guy's going to feel the same as me, mm -hmm. but I knew that if I go up to him and say, I know what you're going through, he'd deny it, he'd defend it like I did. Mm -hmm. Because so, it is what you would yeah. have done. Yeah. If someone was yeah. Down That's what I did when I was in the hospital. I did hand it up. Completely hit it. But, um, <coughs> you know, I've seen it a couple of times since, and I, I, I have no reaction at all now. Mm -hmm. I, have no, I don't feel anything now. I did invite her because we, me and Tom, were making the uh, From the Darkness documentary about uh, female perpetrators, and I'm talking to other male victims of abuse. And I did write her an email and invite her to come on camera, mm -hmm. talk to me, no agenda, mm -hmm. say exactly what you want. Mm -hmm. And the email that I got back was a treasure trove of narcissism. <laughs> and, you know, so, yeah, so I'm, I'm just, re I'm, I've recovered now and I'm just helping other male victims to recover and to speak out mm -hmm. because that's what we need to do. People need to speak out. You don't wake up in the night anymore. Dreaming that Monica is punching you as some dreams that you have. Yeah, yeah. I think when I, <laughs> yeah, when I am, um, when we did break up, yeah, that's what I do. I, I, 
wake up, wake up in the night and I'd, I'd be running downstairs and locking the door because I'd have dreams of Monica stabbing me and attacking me in my sleep. And yeah, but I didn't have any dreams like that anymore. I met a, a wonderful woman now who is uh, absolutely fantastic and really supportive of everything I do. So. Do you think that the relationship with Monica in a certain way, in any way, um, is marking the relationship that we're having now? No, not at all. She has no effect on me at all now. Nothing. The only effect she has on me is that she's the driving force behind all this. Mm-hmm. Behind the film The Darkness. Mm-hmm. She was the driving force behind that and driving force behind the documentary. So, mm-hmm. what she did to me is helping me help others now. So. She has no judgmental effect. In a certain way, she helped you to acquire an identity as a victim or as a yeah. survivor. Yeah. Right? So you are now identified with that image of yeah. survival. In a, in a way, um, without without what happened to me, I wouldn't be the man that I was, <coughs> but that I am now. I wouldn't have met yourself and the other amazing people that I've met. I wouldn't be here talking yeah. about it today. I wouldn't be trying to help other people. Mm-hmm. So, when you are speaking with me, do you notice some kind of anxiety on you yet, or that has disappeared? You can speak. No, I, 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 when I've been talking to you about it and stuff has been brought up, I can feel myself getting emotional. I don't know whether you can hear it, but I can, I can feel myself getting emotional. Okay, I'm going to ask you now. Last and forth, perhaps we have in the audience uh, someone that still believes that man cannot be victim. I don't know. Maybe, maybe one of you guys is suffering from domestic violence. Maybe you do know somebody who is suffering from domestic violence, but you don't know it. You know, maybe you know somebody, but you don't know it. But they need to speak out. That's but it's interesting that it's not the, the victims itself, but it's the ones who want to help victims that seem to are also yeah, shocked oh yeah, yeah. right? <laughs> if you go if you go onto the, uh, the women's aid website, the headline on the women's aid, aid website is domestic violence is a gendered crime. Mm-hmm. This is a is a uh, a group that's at the forefront of uh, domestic violence awareness putting that message out there. It's absolutely ridiculous. If you go on to the Respect website, mm-hmm. then you'll find men and women there. Mm-hmm. And it's, uh, if you click on Help for Men, it'll say, are you a victim of abuse? Are you an abuser? Mm-hmm. Click on the help, and, and then it gives you one website to go to mm-hmm. for help. If you click on Help for Women, it won't ask if you're an abuser. Mm-hmm. And it'll give you pages and pages of help. Things need to change. Which happens that we do not have have services to help men victims, and we do not have programs to help women who are aggressors. Yeah, yeah, so it's true. Help helping male victims can help women as well because it helps the female perpetrators. Mm-hmm. So you know, it, ignoring ignoring male victims ignores the section of women. As well, mm-hmm. so things need to change. The whole society needs to change. It needs to be genderized. Oh God, yeah, yeah. What doesn't have a gender? Right? Yeah, and it's, it's. I know it's hard for for, for guys to speak out. I, I do. I didn't speak out until I've had written a book. But you need to. It ain't, ain't gonna change unless you speak out. The interesting thing is that the women victims want to help men victims, so it, there is no um, bad words against a man who is a victim by a female victim. They have suffered so, many women have suffered so much that they are in sympathy with a man that is a victim. They can understand perfectly and they would never say, say no. So it's people who are not victimized yeah. who are considering the gender part of the violence in intimate relationships. There's only one female victim that 
criticised what I wrote and she, she read my book and she went, it's not as bad as what I went through. And I was like, it's not a competition. <laughs> you know, if a victim is a victim, that's it. You know, abuse is abuse. You know, it, it doesn't matter whether, whether you, you've been beaten in the hell out of or it's one slap. Abuse is abuse. And it shouldn't happen to anybody. Man, one child, man. Oh, I'm starting to introduce speakers to, uh, to my incapacity to speak Swedish, but my idea is to make the, um, the investigation, the research here in Sweden, and to come up how many men there are in Sweden that are suffering as well. I don't believe that there is none, because when I start to scratch and trying to find out information, there is not so much information. And there are, of course, the reports from Broa, as we know, the reports from the police. But when it comes to cases, we want to self-report you know, this important part of men that are not even aware that they are victims. That is what they tell yeah. me. That at the yeah. beginning, I could not understand that I am being a victim because men are not victims. But that's what they themselves. So I hope, or I hope not, that my work is in direction of I hope me coming in and talking about this helps. I hope so. <laughs> That's the idea. Thank you. Thank you, John.